How are we all doing after that very emotional talk there? I had to take a little moment to have a little cry behind stage. Um, it's Bitcoin. It's okay to show your emotions. I'm going to look after you all for the next uh, three, four hours. Um, very much looking forward to it. And I've got some games in store with a few freebies to give away as well. Um, the thing I'm giving away rhymes with cats. You do the rest. Okay. I'm really looking forward to the next panel, chaired by, in my opinion, one of the best moderators in Bitcoin. <laughs> Peter Young, I'd like to welcome to the stage um, from the Free Cities Foundation, who's going to introduce his panel and talk to, talk to us about Bitcoin. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. So I'm very pleased uh, this afternoon to be joined by some uh, expert panelists. Okay, so we have uh, on the stage, we have uh, Chris Hunter, we have Daniel Fortin, we have Francis Puglio and Eric Chacon. And this, uh, this panel is going to focus on everyone's favorite topic, which is regulation. So how should Bitcoin be, be regulated in order to make El Salvador an attractive place for international investment? So the first question I want to ask the panel is about the rationale for regulation at all. So a lot of people are attracted to Bitcoin because it's this kind of open system whereby you don't need to ask permission from anyone else if you want to use the network. There's a set of rules which you can opt into or, or not opt into based on your own voluntary choice. So the first question I want to ask the panel is, should, isn't, the, isn't the best regulation on a governmental level of Bitcoin no regulation at all? Shouldn't we just let the free market decide? So I'm going to ask um, Francis first if you want to come uh, and give an answer to that question. Great question. And the answer is yes. Um, I am philosophically an, an anarchist, a libertarian, an anti-statist. In my view, um, there is no good reason for Bitcoin to be regulated. Bitcoin can't be regulated. So when we're talking about regulation, most of the time what we're talking about is on-ramps, off-ramps. In the case of Europe, maybe you're talking about custodial wallets, even non-custodial open source wallets. Um, I think we'll get into a little bit more of the details of the specific types of regulation that Bitcoin companies may face. But just off the top of my head, there's one that comes into, into mind, which is KYC AML regulations for exchanges, which are the main point of friction to running a Bitcoin company. Um, I'm operating a regulated money service business in Canada. Therefore, I have to comply with AML KYC regulations. I've been studying this topic for the last eight years. In my years of research, I cannot find any example or maybe some, some small negligible ones of money launderers getting caught due to KYC AML regulations. That just does not happen. Terrorists have never been caught because of KYC AML regulations. Um, usually KYC AML regulations are known as anti-terrorist financing laws and money laundering prevention laws. So they do not even serve their objectives. Consumers are not protected by KYC AML regulations at all. In fact, many consumers are hurt by these regulations because they need to give very large amounts of private sensitive data to these companies, which otherwise would not want to be hosting this data, those companies sometimes need to host, hold this data five years, 10 years, depending on the jurisdiction. These companies get hacked, these companies get phished, that information gets released. Um, a lot more regulatory frameworks that we're gonna talk about, but um, in, the, in the case of Bitcoin, no regulation is absolutely best. In the case of shit coins, that's a different story. Maybe we'll touch that later. Um, but yeah. Okay, so no regulation at all is the best answer. Just no requirements on exchanges, no KYC, uh, no, no regulation according of finance on Bitcoin. Does everyone agree or different views here? Mm, I, I have a different, different point of view. I, I, I believe that 
if there was no, or if we do not have Bitcoin law, 64 companies registered in the central bank doing business, Bitcoin services in El Salvador, I mean, we, we, we couldn't have that company here. So in the, in the case of El Salvador, Bitcoin law enabled many businesses. It's, it's a trigger, it was a trigger that, you know, initiate a wave of companies coming to El Salvador, co companies created being here in El Salvador. And I, you can see regulation from two point of view. You can, you can see a regulation as an enabler of businesses, create, I mean, something that creates the spark to create some new industry, which is happening here. Or you can see the regulation as, you know, bad actors using regulation to attack other people or, or the population. So you, you, you can have, you know, both point of view. Uh, and obviously, we need to, to struggle to, to be in the first stage, you know. Using the regulation to enable, to create innovation, to create new companies, to create an industry, to export what we are learning here in Salvador to another countries, instead to see it, you know, in the, in the only the bad way. Can I jump in on that real quick? Um, in, in my view, the, the Bitcoin law is not really a, a regulation of Bitcoin companies, but also, I don't, maybe you can expand on that, I, I don't really see it as helping Bitcoin companies you know, move to El Salvador that much. I mean, the, the first effect of the Bitcoin law is to, um, you know, tell the merchants that they have to accept Bitcoin. But a very good benefit of the Bitcoin law is that you can account for your financial statements in Bitcoin. I don't know if that's actually the case, but I mean, um, I, if Bitcoin is legal tender, you can account for your financial statements in Bitcoin, which is way better than in other countries where on your balance sheet, um, if you have Bitcoin, then you're like, okay, what is it? A liability? Is it an asset? Is it a, an inventory good? So having it as money is, is, is very, very cool for, for accounting's perspective, but maybe you can spend on like, is there any other, like, like how does it help me as a Bitcoin company to have a Bitcoin law? Perhaps we well, can come back to that. We've gone on a bit of a tangent, I'd like to stick to the original question first and build on maybe yeah, let's, let's Fra Francis's comments. Uh, I, I like the fact that Francis confessed that he's an anarchist because anarchy was actually the word that was in my head when um, the, the question was first posed. And I, I think there's a bifurcation that's very useful to make whether we're looking at legal matters here in El Salvador or any other country. And I, I, Peter, at, at, with all respect, I think maybe you, you framed the question poorly. The question should be, should there be Bitcoin specific regulation. And what I mean by that is all around the world we have laws. You know, what, what SBF and his cronies did with FTX recently, they, they stole, they committed theft, and they, they lied and committed fraud, right? And I think most people in this room would agree it's good. I, I don't want anarchy. I, I'm, not, I'm not an anarchist myself. And I, I like having laws against theft and fraud, right? So then if you're going to ask a more specific question is should we have specific Bitcoin laws beyond those common laws such as those against theft and fraud. And I think that's where it becomes a very interesting question. And Francis did hit the nail on the head with the KYC issue, right? And so should we have specific Bitcoin laws regarding KYC or should we even have broad laws on KYC for any financial institution? And I think that's where we should push back, where if we don't, like Francis said, KYC hasn't prevented any malfeasance, right? What prevents malfeasance is tracking for scams, and you can do that without knowing your user, right? And so I run a bank here called the Bitcoin Beach Wallet, right? We're regulated, we're registered with the central bank, we're a Bitcoin services provider. We can track whether scams are happening with our wallets without knowing who controls the wallet. I don't need to know your identity. So I think asking specific questions in that direction related to KYC in particular are much more interesting than just saying, should Bitcoin be regulated or not? Yeah, and I, I do agree with Chris. Actually, it's a meal point. I mean, you cannot regulate Bitcoin. It's, it's impossible, but you can actually create regulations in order to uh, promote that option from traditional users or, no, no, I mean, to help people to actually take the orange pill, you know? Uh, people that do not trust or, or do not understand Bitcoin or they don't know what it is. I mean, regulation can actually create a little certainty for those people to try this financial instrument that actually it's great and understand the good things and start actually using it. And 
I think that you, you should not regulate everything. I mean, too much regulation kills anything. So uh, as Chris says, uh, KYC, and as, uh, as you said, uh, KYC actually is not too good on, uh, on this industry and hadn't, hadn't had done any, anything to actually, uh, I mean, to get someone that does things bad, but KYC instead can actually help you to do that and prevent things that are actually bad. Okay, thank you. So I guess there's a distinction, isn't there, between laws against theft and then specific Bitcoin regulatory uh, regulations. So things that apply only to the use of Bitcoin, only to the use of a particular cryptocurrency. Um, and it's right to make that, that distinction. So perhaps the next question we could, we could touch on, because I know we've got a lot of expertise on what the actual regulatory environment is surrounding Bitcoin. Perhaps we could give a bit of a... Um, overview of what the current situation here is in El Salvador right now. So would someone from the panel be able to give me uh, an overview of what are the key areas that, are, uh, that exist within Bitcoin regulation? So we mentioned AML as one. Um, who can give me a kind of overview of where El Salvador sits relative to other countries? Okay, I can help you with that. I mean, Bitcoin law actually gives you three specific points. First, give you the, give Bitcoin the status of legal tender and oblige people actually to receive it and to actually promote the environment and promote adoption, first of all. Then you have the second part of the law that actually enables the government to create the mechanism, the trust and Chiba wallet to actually enables people to do transactions with, no, with zero fees or no cost. And then you have the third part that actually integrates the traditional financial systems to operate with Bitcoin that actually helps to uh, match both words. I mean, uh, the ones that actually are using Bitcoin and it's uh, something that gets people or makes people that actually start accepting the payment and using this financial instrument and, uh, or this currency. And then you have the, uh, the ones that hadn't, uh, they don't know it or they don't use it and start using it. But uh, in some certain uh, confident uh, regarding regulation, the, the, main, not, the, the main point of, of regulation, the, the main pieces or the main regulations are actually the Bitcoin law, the Bitcoin law regulation that actually set the, the obligations of the Bitcoin services provider, as Chris says, and gives you certainty being registered before the central bank to operate an exchange or a bank uh, before the population, and then you have uh, a specific, a specific technical standards for financial uh, traditional players to provide such services, and then you can actually and you can actually have a different kind of regulation regarding which actors are playing in the in the country. Yeah, in practice, uh, the Bitcoin law. What is happening is, for example, a company wants to come to El Salvador, wants to establish here, so. Uh, the first is that they need to go to the central bank to be registered as a, as a Bitcoin service company. And uh, after that, the superintendent, superintendent, superintendency of uh, financial services approach them and uh, give to them a list of requirements to comply with, right? Requirements that are uh, coming from the financial system law, from the, you know, some other peripheric laws, uh, and also, you know, what Bitcoin law and all the, you know, regulation derivated by, by, by that law, you know, I require for them. So uh, you have to understand also that in Bitcoin, there are different categories of services, like payments, like remittances, uh, uh, even insurances, uh, digital loans, and so on. Uh, every category in the future probably needs a body of regulation to be specific, you know, regulate that categories because, you know, the Bitcoin law is very general. Some uh, regulation are being derivated but not cover the whole, you know, scenario that, you know, uh, financial services through Bitcoin can be, can be created. So, for so far, that is how, you know, in practice the Bitcoin law is applied. So. Companies can come, uh, there is a, a process to follow, and the, and the regulatory entities are very, you know, let's say, you know, uh, helpful, you know, with uh, explaining to the, to the companies what 
you know, a specific regulation they need to comply with. Can we kind of break it down to an example? So you mentioned their remittances as being an area where there's regulation. So if I'm a company that wants to manage US dollar payments um, coming through to El Salvador and I want to pay people locally in Bitcoin, I want to use the Bitcoin payment rails, how am I, how am I regulated? Can you give an example of there what is the a, law there is, Yeah, there is a law derivated by the uh, financial system law, which is a, a, a law specifically for international remittances that, that you need to comply with here in order to you to pay remittances here. And also yeah. if you want to send remittances from, from here to overseas. I mean, we, we can go specific example by specific example, but to make it easy for the audience, um, Things are not as favorable here in El Salvador as you might imagine or might hope them to be. The short way to think about it is, as a Bitcoin service provider, you know, we only deal in Bitcoin, our, my company. We don't deal in physical US dollars, but we're still subject to basically all of the identical regulations that the commercial banking sector is. So in other words, the same standards are imposed upon us and we're effectively playing within the same rules of the game as the, the traditional commercial banking sector, which is not exactly what I think most of us here at this conference are hoping for. So part of what we're doing within my organization is working hand with the finance superintendent who oversees us and the people who have the authority to create new laws in country to push for something better. But the reality is the state of affairs, the current state of affairs isn't that great. Yeah, and that's important because, I mean, I think the supervisory authority is actually learning how to how to how, how does Bitcoin works and how blockchain works as a very specific way. Therefore, they are uh, helping a little bit how uh, Bitcoin services provider to adapt to the regulation. But uh, as Chris says, uh, maybe um, a, a different regulation uh, reg from the traditional actors. It's actually good because I mean you cannot treat uh, a bank uh, the same as a Bitcoin service provider. It has no sense makes no sense. Yeah, it's a really good point that actually a lot of the activity that companies here can engage in is not determined by El Salvador law, it's determined by the law of other countries like the US dollar uh, system, the US financial law. Um, what, last time I was here in El Salvador, I spoke to some banks because I was really interested in how they were going to integrate Bitcoin into their system, given that Bitcoin is legal tender here. And they said that they hadn't been able to do much really because they're really worried about the relationships with their corresponding banks in the US and that really they just need to abide by all the US laws. So I guess the question that I would like to get everyone's view on is given that we live in this international system, what can El Salvador as a country do to try and make uh, it easier for companies to use, to use Bitcoin? Well, I'll pick up on that and your point and then tie in the question. I mean, there, there's a couple of layers here. One is you know, the, the Bitcoin Beach Wallet was a proof of concept born within Galloy, the software company that I co-founded. We spun out the company 11 months ago to be its own corporation and to be a client of Galloy, which is in line with Galloy's business model, where Galloy wants to make banking software and not be the bank itself. And I share that insight because for the 11 months here in country, we've worked with every bank for the most part to try to open a corporate bank account and we're in a country, the only country where Bitcoin is legal tender, we're a homegrown story, every person I've hired within the business is a local Salvadorian, um, you can feel good about what we're doing, and net net, 11 months in, we don't have a corporate bank account open, right? We have no ability, even if we wanted to, to either move US dollars into the country by wire or out of the country by wire. So that, I think, gives you an anecdotal insight in terms of, um, Regulation is one piece, and then there's the reality of just doing business on the ground with banks who are dependent upon the Fedwire and the correspondent banking system there. And they, if they want to serve us, they risk being cut off from that system entirely themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Um, despite the, the irony of the situation, the collaboration and cooperation of the banking system in a country will effectively determine the level of adoption of Bitcoin exchange services. For example, um, in Canada, my home country, um, a lot of the banks are against Bitcoin, but there is a significant amount of banks that will gladly with deal with Bitcoin companies and take them on as partners. And this, to my opinion, is the main reason why Canada has the highest amount of native Bitcoin exchanges in the world. Um, I came to Costa Rica in June, and 
you know, I was down here, so I thought, okay, maybe I can check out could bull Bitcoin operate in El Salvador? That, that could be great. So I, I, I dug around. Um, in terms of the regulatory requirement, you know, they were burdensome, but um, you know, all the Latin American countries um, have the Spanish bureaucratic tradition. So I mean, it's it's nothing n nothing worse than you know Mexico, for example, which is a bureaucratic nightmare. Um, so the regulation, the re regulatory framework, you know, was not ideal but it was manageable. But the main hurdle that I found was, you know, everybody was telling me, you know, you're not gonna be able to get a Salvadoran bank account, or you might be able to get a Salvadoran bank account, but your transactional limits are gonna be so low as to, you know, not be, not be worth it. Um, very ironic. Um, and, you know, as I said, I'm a, you know, I'm more of a minarchist, like Chris, than, than, a, than an anarchist. So I do agree with you that, you know, Theft and murder <laughs> should be, um, uh, I, I agree, in a small amount of state in, in, in this context. Um, but, you know, if you are a government, you're not a, you know, you're not a libertarian like me, and, and you want to use government power to bring about Bitcoin adoption in your country, then you would force your own banks to do so. <laughs> I'm sorry. I mean, that's, uh, to me, that's, that's a no-brainer. Um, you would maybe back them up you know, uh, with, their, uh, with their foreign relations, you may, may be providing support. Um, at least you would try to remove all the excuses that they have for not banking Bitcoin companies. And, you know, the banks do say that they can lose their correspondent banking in the US if they deal with Bitcoin customers, but other banks in the world are dealing with Bitcoin customers and they're not losing their correspondent banking relationships with the US. So. Whether or not that's true, whether or not that's just an excuse they're making, um, I don't know. But bottom line is the banks need to open up to Bitcoin exchange companies here in El Salvador if you want to have competition amongst the Bitcoin services providers. Now there's a very small amount of Bitcoin services providers relatively to the hype that there is here in the, in the country. And I believe it's, as Chris said, it, it's probably due more to the bank's aversion to Bitcoin than anything to do with regulation. Thanks, Francis. So, yeah, the panel is called, um, you know, competitive advantage through Bitcoin regulation. And I'm wondering whether people can give us some uh, insights into how the competitiveness of El Salvador has changed since the law um, was introduced 14 months ago, the Bitcoin law. Can anyone give me some examples of how they've seen uh, foreign investment flow into El Salvador or how they've seen El Salvador become a more attractive destination for uh, overseas investment since the law was introduced? Well, I, I think that since the point of view, from the point of view of the FinTech Association, we are seeing, you know, the evolution. We've been seeing all the evolution. We are witness of the evolution that the Bitcoin law had since the very beginning. Um, in El Salvador, before the Bitcoin law, none, zero BC, coming here to El Salvador to, to explore the market or to see opportunities to invest. Now, with the Bitcoin law, we are in the map of, you know, the whole world. So we are now ready for our president, for our Bitcoin, and, and, and also for the reducing of the crime. So, but Bitcoin is one of the biggest subjects that is giving El Salvador uh, a lot of, you know, um, in a, notoriously. And um, I, I will say that as well, you know, we've, we've been seeing the implementation, and the implementation probably with many problems, as you know, everybody knows, and, and, and we already know everything that happened, but uh, so it, it's not perfect, but uh, I will say that we, we, are, we are the first in the world, and this is something that probably, uh, as Salvadorians, we are not understanding yet. But little by little, with education, as everything else, you know, that gap is gonna be closed. So, uh, I, I agree also that, for example, banking system here so is not that friendly with Bitcoin. But uh, from the FinTech Association, we are starting a, a dialogue with uh, banking companies. And uh, recently, last, last week, I've been speaking with a high executive of, uh, executive of a bank. And, and, and he told me directly, Eric, we want to be recognized as a bank, Bitcoin-friendly bank. So, but you have to tell to, 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 to everybody, I say to him, but uh, that, that, you know, intention at least 
It's a good sign to us to see that the banking, or we can create a, a bridge between, you know, uh, Bitcoin world and banking system here in El Salvador, and then we can export that to other countries. But little by little, I think that education is the key, education, dialogue, so not have, you know, defensive positions with anybody, and, 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 and that it will be, you know, this dialogue starting in El Salvador can be exported to, to, to a, a, you know, everywhere else. Thanks. I was going to ask a question to you, Daniel, actually, which is, given that you work with so many uh, companies from a, from a legal perspective, I wonder if you could share your perception on how international companies are viewing investment in, in El Salvador from your, the work that you're doing with them. Okay, perfect. Great question. Actually, uh, many people, or many investors, as, as Eric said, are coming to El Salvador uh, as, a, uh, as a good thing, uh, at my point of view. El Salvador is, uh, has become a regulatory sandbox for uh, Bitcoin itself, so actually it's good. People come and incorporate their company for, to, to receive payment for what they do in Bitcoin and put it in their, in their balance sheet or, or, of their company and actually start operating uh, and receive the, uh, the, the money and uh, the, the Bitcoin and actually prove that they have the amount at a legal way. And actually other kind of, of, uh, of, of investors come to El Salvador and incorporate a regulated entity as uh, Chris and uh, provide exchange services uh, services as, as an exchange, as a wallet, as a custodial services, payment platforms, etc. From El Salvador, worldwide. I mean, they provide services in Argentina, in Mexico, in Colombia. So actually, it's investment is coming to El Salvador and it's changing the, the point of view of many people about El Salvador and how to do things, great things actually, here in El Salvador. As Eric said, I think there is a middle, a middle point. Education is necessary. For, for to to promote adoption, actually, uh, last year, I can uh, I'm sure that around 80 percent of Salvadoran population do not know about Bitcoin, and now all Salvadorans know about Bitcoin. That's a good uh, a good point. Then, how they more than knowing that Bitcoin say, exists, they should know how to use it and what is actually Bitcoin and all the great things that are around of, of, of Bitcoin. I mean, it's necessary for the Salvadorian population to take the, the orange peel in order to promote adoptions. And I mean, banking is a business. It's all people, if all people actually need to use Bitcoin, they are going to play on the, uh, they are going to accept a Bitcoin services provider and provide services or, I mean, open the game card. Thanks. Does anyone else have anything to add there on international perceptions of El Salvador? One thing I might add, which is often overlooked, is that um, there's a nice recruiting pool for talent that will be growing in Salvador, which is, relatively speaking, cheaper than in other countries. Um, speaking particularly of customer support in Spanish, um, if my company was to, for example, expand in a Spanish-speaking country, I would go to the Mi Primer Bitcoin organization or other local organizations, and I would ask them, hey, do you have any, you know, Bitcoin knowledgeable, yeah, there's a Bitcoin diploma here, that's fantastic. Um, so I think, I think that's kind of often overlooked and I would also, you know, being a, an El Salvadorian, you know, Bitcoin advocate, um, you know, kind of try to sell our workforce a little bit more internationally because that might be, you know, a good benefit. All right, thanks very much. Um, so I want to give a bit of time actually to open this up to the audience to ask whether the audience have any, any questions for the panel. So I was wondering if Joe could maybe help me with a roving microphone to take some audience, audience questions. So if you've got anything you want to ask, please raise your hand and tell us whether it's a question to the whole panel or whether it's directed at a particular person okay. in the panel. I'm ready for your... Any questions? Here we go. Mike. One thing that, that I've seen is that a lot of companies want to come in here and open up and they've actually found that they're better off going outside of El Salvador to set up to serve the Salvadoran market because they're going to be regulated here and required to do KYC and all these things. And so it's actually pushing companies outside of El Salvador rather than bringing them in. 
So what, what if, have you guys seen this and what do you think we can do to make sure this doesn't happen and we don't miss out on this opportunity? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen it within the country, right? Uh, there's rough, in addition to my company, there's roughly half a dozen other great companies. I'm sure most of you know their names here. Um, and, you know, a number of those companies recent weeks have actually downsized their workforce and kind of are going the other direction. So it's not exactly what you said where it's companies aren't coming in per se. Maybe that's the dynamic, but we're certain not necessarily seeing this flourishing of Bitcoin native companies um, in, in country. And so, you know, the title of this panel is competitive advantage through Bitcoin friendly regulation. We certainly don't have that now in country. There is a hope that we can change it going forward, but we, we need to change it if we're going to attract these types of businesses with any degree of scale. If a, if a foreign company is regulated in their home country, one thing that might be interesting is for instead of El Salvador requiring them to be regulated in El Salvador, just recognizing the existing regulatory free framework of the other company. For example, if Bull Bitcoin's regulated in Canada, I want to operate in El Salvador, maybe the government should, should, should say, well, you know, if you're compliant in Canada, I mean, that's good enough for us here. Um, another thing is registering a company here should be very, very simple. A lawyer should not be required. Um, there's a lot of paperwork that could be reduced. You should be able to register a company online like it's the case for Estonia. There's a reason why all you know, these startups are regulated in Estonia. That should be very, very easy. Another thing is, okay, um, you know, President Bukele announced the, the uh, no capital gains tax on, on Bitcoin. That's great, but as a Bitcoin exchange, my income is not capital gains, it's, it's business income, um, corporate taxes. Corporate taxes here, you know, I, I spoke to some, some people knowledgeable and they were way, way higher than in Canada um, where my business is based. So I wouldn't move my headquarters here just because I would be paying like, you know, I think it was twice more tax than in Canada. So that's something that, that uh, obviously should be, uh, you know, completely abolished. Um, and um, last thing, there's two frameworks for MSB regulation and registration. One of them is kind of like an, a license application process where you apply to be granted the license. And there's another framework where you just register and notify the government that you're offering financial services. In Canada, to register as a money service business, you can do that online by yourself. I did that by myself um, seven years ago with zero experience in the business. I just filled out a form. I sent my corporate structure, my shareholder, whatever documents, and then poof, I'm registered as a money service business, and then I can operate. And then later, the government will audit me and make sure I'm compliant. In other countries, you need to prove that you will be compliant in advance. You need to ask for the license to be granted, wait, get the license, be granted. Sometimes you need to prove impact studies, economic feasibility studies. Um, it's a nightmare, right? So registering a company should be a few clicks online, you know, just you know, pay the government a thousand bucks to register a company with a P.O. box in El Salvador. That would be great if you can do that online. Then just register your intention to offer money service business. Poof, click. Um, if you already have an a, 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 a MSB framework in another country, that should be recognized as being valid. And lastly, um, you know, have a talk with the banks. Tell them you got to, you know, get your stuff together. You got to... We... And, and tell the banks, hey, you will, we will not, as a government, we will not fault you for stuff that the Bitcoin exchanges are doing that are banking with you. That's what the banks are afraid of. The banks are afraid of having like an FTX and everybody's going to be like, okay, so who was this FTX banking with? Boof, this bank. And they're going to get blamed. So tell the government, like, just, you know, whatever the exchange is doing with funds in your, in, in your account is not your fault. It's their fault. You will not be held liable. Um, alleviate their concerns. That, that would be, you know, a few simple things that would... You know, and also, uh, I see this in a lot of countries. I don't know if it's the case in El Salvador, but a lot of countries have requirements that you need to have an impact. Like, you need to employ people locally. You need to show that you're going to have a, a positive economic impact. The way that I see it, let people register, like, online companies here. Don't force them to prove or don't, don't tell them you must have an economic impact. Just let them operate here. The economic impact will come later. Um, yeah. I think they say pretty much the, the, the things that must be done. I agree with them. Uh, I think new regulation is about to come to make a friendly environment for uh, actual uh, foreigners or investment to come to, to, to El Salvador. 
I truly believe that law must be modified in order to achieve a digital environment to, to people to actually come and incorporate uh, companies dig, uh, by electronic means. I mean, there are a lot of things that must be done or to incorporate a company by a sole shareholder. No, no, there are no need of two, two, actual, two people to actually incorporate a company. It would be a, a mass simple process and you have to actually promote a public policy to actually educate people about electronic usage, uh, uh, digital adoption, and Bitcoin adoption as a whole package. I mean, you have to promote or facilitate things for companies or for investors, and you actually have to uh, promote people adopting Bitcoin and using Bitcoin and digital means if you want to actually make it a complete fr uh, friendly environment uh, for Bitcoin. Uh, since the you know by the way of the fintech association, we since, since the very beginning of the of the law, we have been receiving many inquiries from our, from outside the, peop, the from companies that wants to to come here to uh, inquire us you know how the business environment here is and uh, yeah we we always speak with everybody. Uh, the thing is that di different companies have different approaches to come to El Salvador. Some companies are coming uh, directly to put the, the office, some others are sending scouts to exploring, and, and, and uh, some others, you know, are waiting, are deciding to, to see what happens for one, two years, and then they, they, they will come here. So different strategies, different approaches, different, you know, point of views uh, of companies coming here. Some, some companies come, implement, trying to reach break even here the market is very slow many competitors uh, they in some point decide to go out and and yeah it happens so it's part of the dynamics that the market have and I will say that the, this is a normal you know behavior of the market obviously there is a lot of efforts to do uh, so we are here discussing obviously many improvements to to the laws the current laws that we have but just Right now, we can open the door to many companies outside to come here to establish their offices, to establish, you know, uh, the representatives here. And uh, I, I will say that in the future, it's going to be bigger, you know, because there is no other way that to improve what we have. Okay, thank you. I think we've got time for one more audience question. Yeah. I saw uh, Ryan's hand shoot up at the back over there. I don't know if he's available. Here we go, Ryan. Ryan. Thank you. Was there any uh, regulatory timeline uh, in relation to the Bitcoin law? My first trip to the country was in March. I was hoping to coincide it with the release of the Bitcoin laws and the way of raising money that Bukele was going to do by raising fiat and then investing into Bitcoin mining and Bitcoin directly. Now, that's probably best that he put it on hold, but was there any clarity on when laws will be put in place, say for Bitcoin City, to attract entrepreneurs like me that would be happy to keep 90% of their earnings and be able to give more back to the community. I think we can keep this brief. There, there's no specific clarity, although we're, we might be hearing news very, very soon. Anyone else on any timelines that there are regarding any new piece of regulation in, uh, regarding Bitcoin in El Salvador? Maybe don't have too much to add on that one, Ryan. Is there anyone else that uh, would like to ask another quick question? Okay, maybe, in that maybe, case. Maybe, maybe I'll, I'll fill the void with an opinion. Go for it. <laughs> so, you know, we're talking about competitive advantage for, through Bitcoin friendly regulation. And uh, I feel like e even kind of in the, the title of this panel, we're losing our way. And what I mean by this is we're trying to create a a future on open source money that's unseizable, uncensorable, hard money, right? And the insight there is I have no insight whether here in El Salvador or any other country to create a, a system on Bitcoin that mimics the closed permission discriminatory system that we all participate in for the most part thus far. And so, you know, if we're, we're going to get the regulation right, as, as Francis highlighted, the key thing is KYC, right? The ideal solution is no KYC. Me, as a Bitcoin service provider, I don't need to know who you are in order to provide you easy-to-use tools to allow you to live 
your life in relative financial freedom. If we can't have no KYC, then we should have KYC only on people moving, you know, very large sums of money through the system, maybe one or two percent of the user base. You know, the second bit is, and that's really the key thing on regulation. Second bit is the commercial banking system, as Francis also highlighted, they're the real bottleneck, right? So we need banks to partner with us just to give us access if we are going to use the commercial, the existing commercial banking system as an on and off ramp. If not, we've got plans just to basically help create an entire system where you don't need to touch the commercial banking system. We've already got this new stable sat feature, which gives you dollar certainty with no token, no stable coin, and no connection to the commercial banking system. And then if we introduce a new product next year, where we provide fiat on and off ramp, not through an ATM or a bank, but through, say, your local bodega or merchant, all of a sudden, you know what? We don't need to worry about any of this stuff because we've created the easy to use tools on open source money. And so um, just want to keep the big picture in mind here. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> so perhaps we could go to the final three panel members and hear their concluding thought. Um, what's your uh, advice on what we need to do regarding um, Bitcoin regulation in El Salvador? I think actually that one important thing is that, that El Salvador take the first step and actually make Bitcoin as legal tender. But you have to understand what you're regulating and you have to listen you have to listen to the Bitcoin service provider. I mean, Chris had a very good point. I mean, I don't need KYC. Why are you regulating as the same as a bank? Cool, but as a regulatory entity, as, a super, uh, uh, as the SSF, you have to change your mindset or actually hire a specialist on blockchain, on Bitcoin, to actually create a friendly framework to promote this, to actually make things happen. I mean, we had something good, but we can improve anything and make it work. Yeah, in my opinion, I think that many things can be improved, but I think that complementary regulation needs to be uh, implemented here in Salvador. For example, the, the personal data um, the protection data uh, law is necessary here in Salvador, like the GDPR that European countries have. Um, so that can trigger more different, you know, services in the country. Also, uh, an open banking or open finance regulation or, uh, can be, you know, issue here in order to all the participants in the ecosystem can share, you know, an API services and, and interoperate with each other, which is, which is a need because even, even in the Bitcoin world, there are some aisles, you know, working, you know, isolated and it's, something that we need to change you know probably with regulator regulation we could you know improve that interaction between companies between banks between you know other other environments or financial services that you know uh, as as everything needs to work you know as a as a as a one uh, so many things to improve but i think that at least these two parts are are important to 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 a point only thing I would add is um, allow people to get residency here without paying the three bitcoins. Just make it free. Make it a two-year renewable um, residence. That would help a lot, I think, in bringing a lot of people here. And, you know, the government is regulating the banks. It is allowing them to operate under certain conditions. Um, you know, as I said, I'm not pro-state, but if you are going to try to get bitcoin, and that's what matters, just force the banks to allow bitcoin businesses to bank with them. And on that note, I want to thank our panelists for sharing their insights, and I thank you very much for listening. What a panel. What a panel. Well done, guys. Well done, well done, well done. Um, don't look at your phones just yet. Um, don't check in on Twitter. Thanks, Francis. Thanks, Peter. Um, well done. We're going to play a game right now. Um, I love to play games. And the winner of this game wins some sats. So I want everybody on their feet because, stand up, please. We're going to find out who the most hardcore Bitcoiner is in this room right now.